Right. Okay. Well, I'll I'll begin. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to look very easily at comments or anything like that. So, if anybody has any questions, I'll keep an eye on Twitter or something like that. So, do feel free to ping me a message over there, and I'll read it out if I get any. I'm on Twitter at at Mad Simon J. So let's begin. Um, so. This is going to be a talk about functional programming with C Sharp. Now, from my own background, I am the author of this book here, published by O'Reilly last year. Feel free to scan this URL, which um, I'm told will give you about a month or so free on the O'Reilly platform. And um, I'm going to give you today a nice, gentle, easy introduction into how to adjust your way of thinking in order to adopt a more functional style of programming, which I believe contains an awful lot of benefits. So let's talk first about the functional programming paradigm, or rather, let's talk about what is a paradigm. So let's start with a metaphor. Here is Kurt Cobain playing an acoustic guitar, and Taylor Swift playing an acoustic guitar, and Shania Twain, and Jimmy Page. There's a whole load of very, very different musicians, all playing the same instrument, all playing very different styles of music, but nevertheless using the same instrument. Well, a paradigm is like that with a programming language. It's a style of programming. A paradigm is defined by the areas of the language which you choose to use or not use. So there are two major families of paradigm. There is imperative and declarative. There are others, but these are the two major ones. Imperative is the style of programming that most of us are taught when we begin and an imperative word programming works by guiding the executing environment through the various steps it needs to go and where it needs to go and when it needs to go, giving it every little detail of exactly what it needs to do in minute detail. Procedural is a form of imperative which involves grouping things into functions and allowing those to, um, uh, to be executed by calling them OOP I'm guessing probably most of the folks on this call are likely to know OOP as that is object oriented programming. Declarative, on the other hand, doesn't work the same way. It's not so concerned with things like order of operations and the minutiae of how we assemble things and how the data is processed. Declarative is more focused on what you want and describing what you want and then leaving a lot of the detail to the environment. Functional programming is a declarative language or rather a declarative paradigm. There are others. I don't think logic is used all that much outside of some forms of AI. And I've heard tell that reactive is becoming a thing now, but I don't know. Functional is one of the only declarative paradigms I know. So what are the advantages of using it? Well, it's easier to maintain. It's easier to read. It's easier to modify. Functional programming tends to encourage good code style. So you tend to end up with good code that remains good for longer. It discourages bad practices. It's more robust, that is, it, it tends to fail less and it's more testable as well. So those, those are very significant advantages. Disadvantages though, on the other hand, there's a learning curve. It's not that bad as you might imagine. Um, there's actually fewer things to learn with, object or, with, um, with functional compared to object oriented. Just as a warning, it can be suboptimal performance. Now, can be. 99% of the time, it's not, and it's fine, and you'll never notice the difference. There are some circumstances where if performance is a major factor of the application that you are working on, then perhaps this isn't ideal, but only if 100% emphasis on performance is important to you. Like, perhaps you're putting together a VR game where you have two HD streams of data going down uh, the wire. That's where every tiny little bit of performance matters. But outside of that, mostly doesn't matter. So we'll talk about each of the features, why they exist, and try and show you how you go about adopting them uh, in terms of mindset. So one of the first and the most important is immutability, which means that once you've instantiated a variable, you can't change it, not ever. Everything is unchangeable, and all of their properties are unchangeable. Let's talk through a slightly silly example. This is using one of my favorite TV series, Doctor Who. This is a bit of imaginary code just to give you a silly idea of the problems that will happen if you don't follow 
this concept. So let's instantiate a new main character for our TV series, uh, played here by William Hartnell. Um, we'll make an episode and then let's do some things in our episode. This is a bit of a silly example. This is a bit of imagination, but bear with me. And then at the end, we're going to do a console.write line to write out the name of our actor. So all good, right? Well, let's execute this and see what happens and what we get on the console. Well, we don't get William Hartnell, we get Humphrey Bogart. So what happened? Well, as it happens, where in C sharp, when you pass an object in as a parameter, you're passing by reference. So that means that you are passing the real instance of your object into each of these functions. And if they modify anything, it stays modified in the outside world as well. Turns out that if you call the act silly function, it actually changes the actor name to Humphrey Bogart. Now, this is a silly example, but in some ways it's illustrative of the sorts of problems I have seen. But what if it wasn't there in just simply an act silly where we can deal with it? What if it was in a sub function called from act silly or a sub sub function or a sub 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 function hidden all the way down there in this nested chain of functions? Or what if the logic that causes this to happen was split in three different places? Now, don't laugh because I've seen this. Now, it wasn't something as ridiculous as changing the name of William Hartnell to Humphrey Bogart. It was actually something to do with pricing. But the logic required to make that change all the way out in the outside world was contained several levels deep. In fact, the real problem is far worse than this. It involved things like separate uh, DLL libraries and all sorts of other things. It was painful. But you get the idea. If we had been treating everything as immutable, unchangeable, this would never have happened. This is a little bit of maths working. So this is the inspiration for how you think in terms of writing immutable style code in C sharp or whatever other language. So this is the maths working for calculating the hypotenuse of a triangle. That is, given the length of two of the sides of the left of a triangle, what's the length of the third? Each line is an assignment of something into a variable. A first variable is called A, it is literally assigned to 10. Think of it not as code, but as a definition. The definition of A is 10. The definition of B is 15. And then we have a function, which I called F. I don't have to call it F, but I called it F. And the definition of F is a two parameter function, which if past parameters returns the square root of the sum of x squared and y squared. So finally, the definition of hypotenuse is call the function f and give it a and b, and that is the definition. So in maths working, at least exams in the UK, you can get partial marks even with a wrong answer, because if you show you're working, that means that you can see stage by stage where did you go wrong and you can get marks up until the point when you went wrong because we can see all the working that you did to build up to your answer whereas simply giving an answer is is, is just wrong it will get you nothing so imagine another scenario so uh, this is first this is how it might look in c sharp same basic idea now these are actually mutable in c sharp but i'm treating them as immutable each line has an equals in it and each equals is an assignment. And that is pretty much how I write all of my code. So returning to Humphrey and William Hartnell here, how do we solve this problem? Well, I probably change the function to a dress as Humphrey Bogart function and return a new object based on the old one with the modification. Or I could even go a step further and turn it into a dress as function and take in the name of whatever actor I want. So there we go. And what we do is, Instantia uh, is call dress as to create a new instance of the doctor object and then reference that throughout. But the original object is still unchanged in the uh, back at the beginning, which means in my console.write line, I can actually even reference both. So here's a slightly less silly example and another example of how, what the benefits are for working this way. So let's imagine that this is a function for calculating the price of something. I don't know what doesn't really matter. So I'm going to take its part ID and get the part. I'm going to get out its basic price, multiply that basic price by VAT, that is value added tax, and then add on some sort of markup. Fine. But what if the price that we get out of this is wrong at the end? What do we do? Where do I have to put my breakpoint in order to diagnose the problem? 
well, I'm probably going to have to put it somewhere at the beginning of the function, maybe in the, maybe on the curly brace, maybe on one of the first two lines. And then I'm going to have to step through it and each time make a note of what it is that, uh, um, what it is that is, um, uh, the price is at each stage. I share the wrong screen. Oh God. What have I shared? Okay. Share the wrong screen. Sorry about this, folks. Let's try this again. Uh, uh, uh. Let's try sharing PowerPoint and allow. Yeah. Can somebody tell me if that's okay now? Hopefully that's all right. I'm sharing, um, am I sharing the right screen now? Two forty-one. oh dear. Uh, this is annoying. Uh, 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 present, share screen. Stop sharing. Present share screen. Hello. Okay. I'm trying to press the share screen button, nothing's happening. Well, I'll try, leave, try leaving and come back in. Okay, let's try this. Present, share screen. Select, I want to share the. Okay. Apologies for anyone who's listening. How's that? Are we seeing? Uh, How's that? Anybody? Nothing on screen. Great. Oh, goodness me. Tell you what we are going to do. I'm going to try and upload my slides and see if I can do it from that. Then maybe that will solve the problem. Okay, my slides are uploading at the moment. I really am sorry to everybody for this. Try that. How's that? How's that? Are we seeing everything? We're we seeing it. Oh, your beauty. Do I? Uh, okay. Well, that has the added advantage. I can now see the comments thread, which I couldn't before. So let's just blast through this to where it, um, it's slightly squashed some of the text. But it's okay. We're we're at least able to give our talk. Right. Do I need to go back through everything um, again, or were you able to see it in some sort of mangled form? I think. Right. Okay. I'm going to assume that you're at least able to see everything. So apologies again to everybody for that. There we go. Minor technical problem. The show may now continue. So calculate price. Um, we. Yeah. Good. Uh, right. So where would I put my breakpoint in order to um, determine? 
where the problem was. Well, I'd probably have to put the breakpoint somewhere near the beginning of this function and uh, then step through it and then make a note at each point because as we change price, as we do a multiply equal or a plus equal, we are destroying the original value of price and replacing it with something else. So if you, on the other hand, worked in an immutable style, then you have two advantages. One is I could put a breakpoint similarly on the return and then I can hover over each of the previous steps in turn and see what their values were. And then like with my mathematical working, I can um, work out where it went wrong. So I can get to the source of my problem quicker. And by putting a name here, we have also the small advantage that we're able to get a little bit of extra documentation in effect with the variable names in our function. We can explain what the purpose of each line is. So there's less need for putting any um, comments in or anything like that. So moving on, results oriented architecture. So I don't know if there's a proper formal name for this, but this is the name I use. That is that functional being a declarative language is much more concerned with the results than how we obtain them. So consider this bit of TSQL. What is the actual order of operations in this TSQL? Well, it's, it's not the order that you write them in. It's actually something more like this. So other than perhaps the order by, the select is actually the very last thing to be executed. And that's the thing that we're the most interested in. That's the thing that we actually want at the end. Then if you want to go beyond simply the select, you go into further detail beyond that to work out how the select came by the data that it operated on. And that's ideally the way to write um, C sharp code as well, at least if you want to write it in uh, uh, um, a functional style. So here's another slightly ridiculous made up example. I've got a data uh, item, I've, I've called it complex com uh, custom object, fine. And I'm trying to assemble it based on various bits of source data, whatever that is, it doesn't really matter. And it's got four properties and I've just called them A, B, C and D. What uh, property A and property B are is relatively straightforward, no real problem there, they're just two things added together. But things get complicated a little with C and D. There are two different places in which these are defined because we've used a branching if statement. And there are two different places where C or D might be assigned a value. Now, this isn't too bad. There's only two different ones. But then what if I started doing things like this? I put an if inside the if, which contradicts the previous um, condition. There are now four places that C is defined and four places that D is defined. And that can get complicated fast. It certainly isn't a tech and style that stacks up well if you start adding more and more complexity in it. I've seen code bases like this, and I've seen worse. I've seen far worse than this. Rather, it would be better to rearrange the code so that everything is structured around a single definition of truth for each of those properties, A, B, C, and D. There is only one place each of those properties is defined. And there's a little bit of logic that they refer back to. So if you need to know what is the definition of old group, then you can look back and see what the Boolean logic is. And if the logic gets more complicated than a simple Boolean like that, you could then start branching out into um, certain, you know, separate functions that have more detail in them. Um, so that, that you know, reduces your overall level of complexity. It means there's still only a single place where C and D are defined. So it's easier to keep that maintained. Um, it also stops anyone uh, from putting in more logic than really belongs at this point because it's defined in this way inside a um, an object constructor. Think of it, if you like, as being like an onion. You've got your outer layer of your onion, which is the top level definition, like the select statement, which is just the, the literal take the data that's been prepared at this point and tell you how to render it. If you care, you can go a level deeper and have a look at the level underneath that. And if you care to know more about that, you can go a level deeper again and, and so on. Think of it as layered. You don't need to care about the very innermost layer when you're all the way on the outside at the select level. Uh, with object oriented code, you often have to blend those layers together because you've got no choice in the matter. Whereas with functional style code, you can keep them separated out. You can abstract things in a much more succinct easy to maintain manner. So present uh, predictable code with no side effects, often called a pure function. So that is when you write a function in 
functional style code, you want it to always have the same predictable results no matter what you do. Given the same variable in, you get the same result out and no side effects. Nothing else should happen as a result of executing this function. Like, for example, inadvertently transforming yourself into Humphrey Bogart. So these are pure functions. Add there takes two variables, A and B, and it returns A plus B. If I give it 10 and 20, it's going to return 30. It will always return 30. It will never do anything else. That's all it will ever do. Same result, predictable. Nothing else happens. The say hello there is the same. So it doesn't is null or white space check so that if the name is null or white space, that is some spaces or something that's not visible, then it will give you a standard message. Otherwise, it will give you the name. And that is to prepare the thing you are greeting. And then it will return hello plus whatever that greeting is. There's pretty much no way to make this fail. It'll always return the same result. Given the same name, it will always give the same string back. So that is predictable, pure functions. And these are examples of impure functions. So add now um, takes A and B and adds them to some sort of total, whatever this total might be, and then returns the total. So this means every single time you call this, you're getting a different answer back. If I called it with 10 and 20 initially and I got 30, then the new total presumably goes from zero to 30. And if I give it 10 and 20 together, I'm getting back 60 and then I'm getting back 90 and so on. It's different every time. That is not pure. That is not predictable. And um, that is going to be slightly harder to test and to, to, to use. Say hello, believe it or not, is actually also impure. It does return the same thing, maybe, although it's referencing an internal property, so who can say? We don't know what else is messing around with that property. But on top of that, there's no null check. Uh, so it's not impossible that you might get yourself a null exception at this point. And if that happens, well, that, that's an example of a side effect. Um, in functional style code, we don't have the concept of thrown exceptions. We have other ways of handling errors. And then the final one is impure because as a date time dot now, and even though it has a null check and it has a parameter that's passed over there, it has a date time dot now reference. And that means it will literally be different every single time you call it. So that's not pure either. If you wanted to make that last one pure, you probably also pass a date time dot now as a parameter so that it can be stitched into your function. That would make it pure then. So what are the advantages of pure functions of these sort of no side effect predictable functions, we can make use of something called memoization. So I'll briefly explain what that is. Let's imagine for a moment that somehow I've made a memoize function. I have, but I'll explain how it works in a minute. And we've now got a memoized version of a func delegate. So my func delegate is a function which takes an integer and then adds 10 to it. It's simple because I want to keep things simple for examples. So if I memoize it, it's done some extra magic to it. There's an extra layer around the function now. And it has to be a func delegate, by the way. You can't apply extension methods to a function in C-sharp. Um, now, I've called it four times on the lines below, twice with 10 as a parameter and twice with 30. If it's memoized, it only actually performs the calculation twice, once to define A and then once again to define C. If it's memoized, it stores the result from the given parameters and then returns a stale version of that result if you supply the same parameters again, which means that you basically got um, function level caching. It's, it's a form of caching. But because you've written pure functions with no side effects, you can do that freely and it should always work without problem. If you want to see how it's implemented, well, there's actually quite a few ways you could implement this. This is my super duper -si, uh, simple version of how I might implement it. Um, I've created a dictionary inside the memoize extension method, and I require that a function is given to me which turns the old value into the new value, uh, or the key into the uh, you know the the parameter into the final value. And then I check the dictionary to see if that key that that parameter has been supplied. If it has been then just return. Otherwise, if it hasn't been, add it to the dictionary and then return. So in the case of my example, uh, I call m add 10 with 20. It checks to see if 20 is in the dictionary. It's not. It adds 20 into the dictionary with the answer of 30. And then when b comes around for var b, then it sees 20 again. It checks the dictionary, finds it's there, 
and that the value stored in the dictionary for key 20 is 30, so it just returns 30. Now, I wouldn't do this for a simple add function. That's ridiculous. But imagine that instead of simply adding 10, there was some sort of incredibly complicated logic running behind the scenes. Now, in my book, I gave the example of working out Bacon numbers. And Bacon numbers is actually a highly complicated, from a code perspective, process of trying to work out how many steps there are uh, going from film to film between a given actor and Kevin Bacon. Um, but it does mean that you'll encounter the same actor again and again because the same actor will have appeared with the same uh, with same co-stars multiple times. And so rather than calculating their Bacon number again, you can memorize it and then it'll only ever calculate the Bacon numbers of actors you've never seen before at this point. So you've saved yourself a whole load of processing power. You can also do it with more, with more um, parameters. Now, this is my answer to that. There's probably some edge cases that I'm missing out here. Um, and all I do is convert it into a string. I've just gone something like parameter one, comma, parameter two. I suspect this won't work with complex object or arrays if those were your keys. So to make this really work, you might have to do some sort of hashing process or, or maybe have select based on the different types of parameter. I don't know, but I'm keeping it simple so that I can demonstrate the principle to you. And that's how you'd use it. Same basic idea. So now, once again, the add of X and Y is only done twice. Once when A is given a value, and then once when C is given a value. B and D are given values out of a dictionary. Functions, not statements. So what does that mean? Um, functions are, for the purposes of this definition, anything that returns a value. So anything that can be assigned into a variable, that's a function for the purposes of this. And statements are things that don't. So things that change typically the flow of execution. If for each, for while, and do while, those are your, your classic statements. Um, so how do we get rid of these? Okay, well, ifs are pretty easy. Ifs are okay. Um, you basically just use a switch expression. Now, switch expressions are a phenomenally powerful new form of function available to us in C Sharp. And they are functions, they behave as functions, and effectively you give it sort of a list of functions, and it uses the selector on the left-hand side of the arrow to decide which function it should execute. As it happens, though, in this case, everything that's inside the body of the functions is a simple return with um, a string. But there are more complicated versions of this process. Um, in the first example, we're switching based on the properties of an object. And you can have a select based on ranges within the property or and literal values and all sorts of other things. In the second example there, we're switching on a parent type, which has th uh, two different types that have inherited from it. And we're switching based on what is the real type of the object, which we're currently referencing as the parent object. And not only will it switch based on the child type, it will also automatically rewrap them into a new local variable, which you can reference and have all of the local properties. That's amazing. Imagine how much code you have to write to do that the long way around. And these, the most, one of the very newest things you can do is that you can now switch based on the contents of arrays, not just the literal content, but also things like, you know, oops, this or this and um, similar. So there's pretty much no logic that you can do in an if statement that you can't do in a switch expression. The only difference is that the switch expression expects it to evaluate to a value rather than being a branch of lines of code. So it's forcing you instead to think about how do I collapse this one thing with many possibilities into another thing based on all the different possibilities that can happen. It's forcing you to go down the line of good code structure, simplified code structure, and far, far briefer um, code in terms of numbers of lines written. Now, what about if there are two variables? The switch expressions are all well and good in terms of taking a single object and doing all sorts of um, select based on it. That's fine. But what if there's two? What if I've got A and B and I need to do some sort of logic that combines them? Well, as it happens, that's really easy. You um, you put them into a tuple, which is just normal normal brackets, and then switch based on the tuple. The tuple just basically throws together what amounts to a temporary object 
consisting of whatever you put into it, and then you can switch based on those properties. So there really is no reason not to use this. Uh, there's nothing an if statement can do that this can't. So about for each, for each loops. Okay. Um, well, the, the for each is actually the easiest one of all of these. It's a select statement and things like sum and average and similar. That's easy. You can even go with the, if you don't want to use sum, you can go with the more complicated aggregate version. Aggregate is the sort of the grown ups version of sum, where instead of just literally adding together every item out of an array, you can supply your own custom logic to tell it what to do at each stage. It's a very, very powerful function from Link. And what about for loops, though? For loops are different to for eaches, although I don't see them much anymore. 99% uh, of the time there's ever a for these days, it's always a for each, but how can you replace a for loop? Because a for loop has a counter variable, iterator value. It's typically zero, it starts at not always, and then it will iterate increasing a certain amount, in this case one, to i, each time that we go around the loop until a predefined condition is met, which is in this case that i should be, let it, it should continue for as long as i is less than the length of the array. So what I'm doing is iterating through the array and returning a new array, which is in each element of which is equal to the corresponding elements of A and B multiplied together. So that is A at position zero multiplied by B at position zero. The next element is A at position one multiplied by B at position one, so on and so forth. Can I recreate that using um, uh, link? You certainly can. There you go. Zip. Zip is a function in link which takes two arrays and basically places them side by side into a new array containing um, two properties for each element, first and second. First represents the element out of A and second the corresponding element out of B. So in my case I have an int two int arrays so both of mine will be ints, first and second will both be ints and the first element that is at position zero of the new array will contain first as the position at zip, uh, the uh, item at position zero in A and the item at position zero out of B and so on and so forth, which means I can zip the two arrays together and then select to convert them into a new form, which is first multiplied by second. So this second example using zip is entirely equivalent to the first code sample, but there's no for loop with the added advantage that it's no longer a concern if um, uh, things like uh, um, if the thing's empty, this will just be handled very elegantly because then the, the functions will be executed. Right. Um, get diffs. How about this? This is reducing down an array into the difference between consecutive elements. So let's say that we have an array which contains 10 and 15, then I want the first element of the new array to be five, the difference between those two numbers. Can you do that with zip? Well, strictly speaking, no, you can't because zip just places two arrays together side by side. So what if I want to compare consecutive elements? You can. You do a skip. So skip returns a new array or a new enumerable, which is equal to the previous enumerable with one element skipped over. So starting at position zero of the newer uh, enumerable is position zero of the original, uh, position one of the original. Then do a zip against the original array. So now what you've got is the same array referenced twice, same enumerable, I should say, referenced twice, but once we've skipped one. So they're slightly out of alignment, which means that second is now the element one ahead of first. So we are now able to compare consecutive elements using zip and skip so that we can get our diffs. So this again is an entirely equivalent piece of code to the first sample. How about this then? Here's another slightly tricky scenario for for loops. This time, what I wanna do is actually use the value of i to create a string. So I'm taking an array of strings, who knows what, what, they're, what they're for, perhaps they're messages, perhaps they're logs. And then I want to transform them into a, a new form where a, position in uh, number is in, uh, put at the left of each string. So the first element out of the array is now going to say one dash and then the original message and then next to the two dash the original message and so on. How do we actually get the value of i out? Well, it's a few ways, but one way you can do it is to do enumerable.range, 
enumerable.range creates a new array um, which starts at a predefined number and then each element is equal to one more than the previous going up to a certain length. So I'm saying start at one, give me input.length. Let's say that input.length is three. So I want a three element array and that will consist of one, two, three, like that. That's, that's my values of i. That's all possible values of i. And then do a zip against the original input, which means that now first is equal to the value of i, and second is equal to the string out of the original element, original uh, enumerable. And you can get the exact same thing again, except there you go. Uh, with the added advantage that this is link, so that this means everything is subject to lazy evaluation, meaning it won't actually evaluate this into a real array until you tell it to. So you can even do further array modifications like selects and skips and all the rest of it without having to modify the code, uh, at least this code. But while loops. Now, while loops, uh, unlike fours and for eaches, fours and for eaches are what you might call definite loops. That is a loop that starts here and ends here, and it is declined, defined definitely what the, uh, the iteration cycle is. A while loop, on the other hand, uh, is indefinite. So the while loop is going to carry on going around and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, until a condition is met. Can you do that? No. Not really exactly. I mean, the classic method in uh, in functional programming is recursion. Um, but the problem with recursion is that it's not very uh, friendly to your memory in C sharp. If you're not sure what you're doing, you could end up basically exploding the stack and overflowing it. It's not the best of ideas, unless you're very sure what you're doing. The other method is called trampolining. Um, goodness knows why, I don't know but fine, trampolining. And this is what that would look like. So this is a while loop where I'm going to loop around until return value is greater than 10, greater than or equal to 10. And each loop iteration will add one to the value of return value, which starts input. So this is either going to return 10 or a value greater than 10 because it didn't iterate because we were already greater than 10. And that's what a trampolining version of this might look like takes two, um, two arrow functions. The first is the condition to continue, that is that x must be less than 10. And the second is what to do to x each time you go around, which is to add one to it. There's all sorts of other implementations of this possible, but this is the simplest one I could think of. So this would be equivalent to the previous, um, the previous loop, like this one. But how do you implement this? Well, you, you hide a while loop inside a... Uh, Okay, someone says that you don't find the uh, the replacements very intuitive. But you'd be surprised. Once you've done it enough times, it becomes pretty easy. I actually rather like them myself, especially as they tend to be more concise. So unfortunately, though, hiding a while loop fundamentally is the only way to do while loops, because it really is the only implementation. F sharp allows for um, uh, recursion, but doesn't explode the stack. But if you have a look behind the scenes at what it's really doing, in the IL, it's basically turning it into a form of while loop. There's no other way of doing an indefinite loop. It's just the way it is. So I'm not feeling too ashamed using something like this. But honestly, if you want to still just stick with whiles and just say that this is a conceit because this is the way C sharp is, I'm not going to scream at you. It's fine. Use as much or as little of what I'm showing you as you want. So project structure, how do you structure a project to this? This tends to be a fairly typical way of structuring it. So the, the term is imperative shell um, functional call. So at your shell, the place where you interact with, say, the databases and web APIs and similar, then you make that, that may have to be imperative. That might have to be old OO style code because you often don't have a choice. Errors can be thrown at this point because you're dealing with the external world, even with uh, things like files, even if it's on the same file system as your executable, it could be that there'll be someone else opening the file at the same time and that would result in an exception being thrown or who knows what. There's any number of things that can go wrong. So you're going to have to accept that it's possible that problems will occur that will need some sort of imperative solution. But what then outside of that sort of communication layer dealing with the outside world, I would have just about 
pure functional code from that point in. This is all of your business logic. I'd make all of the business logic as purely functional as possible, writing with pure functions, that is no side effects and uh, predictable results. But then you see the little red dot in the middle there? The little red dot in the middle there is my extension methods. So there are extension, if I'm gonna write somewhere close to purely functional code, there are occasional conceits and exceptions I have to make to my functional style because it's just again C sharp, like while loops, there's no other way. So some of that has to live there in the extension method, but everything between those points, make that as purely functional as you like. And what you'll tend to get is a much better written, much more solid and less error prone code base compared to writing it other ways. So how are we, how are we doing for time? I think we're, are we, I'm running slightly late because of our technical problem. Apologies for that. Unless everyone's gonna disappear for lunch, I'll carry on. But if you all disappear, I won't. I won't shout at you, uh, but handling side effects just quickly. Think in terms of Schrodinger's cat. So Schrodinger's cat is um, a hypothetical thought experiment. No one actually ever did this. And the idea is that you put a cat in a box, seal the box, and the cat is also in its box got uh, a radioactive isotope, which has a 50-50 probability of either creating a radiation spill that kills a cat or doing nothing, in which case you've got an alive, but probably very annoyed cat. Um, but it, until you open the box, you don't know which you've got, and it kind of exists in both states at the same time, because until you open, you don't know. And that's kind of the way that you handle side effects in functional style code. So I've got a type that I've called result here. It's got all sorts of other names, but result has two states, success and failure. This represents trying an operation which might fail or might succeed. I use this to represent anything touching the outside world. So if I'm doing a database operation, or I'm doing a web API call or something like that, something external in the real world could cause a failure, in which case I wouldn't know that it failed and not just that it didn't find any values when I looked it up. And then what you could do is call, consider this result to be like Schrodinger's box. The result is the box, it's the outside level of the box. Inside result is either success or failure, but I don't know which. So in your communication layer, you can have a Web API call, which results in either success or failure, don't know which, you take whichever one it was, put it inside the result box, seal it up, and then pass it around your business logic. And most of the time, your business logic functions that have the result are just passing it around. They don't need to know if it was success or fail. They just know that this is the result and I'm gonna pass it along, potentially. And then finally, at the end, when you reach, say, your MVC layer or something like that, then that's the time when you actually open it and have a look and see what you've got. And for that, I would use something like a switch expression to check the real type. So how I'd implement it is like this. I make an abstract class, I call it result, and give it a generic of T because it, T is whatever it contains, the real the real value, the, the, the enumerable of data out of the database or whatever it is that you've looked up. And then a failure, which instead of a value has an exception contained, which is whatever the error was. Hopefully everyone can see that. Apologies, this screen share style isn't the best. It's uh, ruined all the fonts as well. So this is a very simple example of how I might use this to download some web content. And uh, this is a simplified version of downloading web content. I've stripped out a lot of real code just to make it simpler to see. So what I'm doing is um, doing a try catch around the whole thing. If the catch is triggered, that is a, an handled exception occurred, then I'll return a failure. And if it didn't, then I'm going to have a look at the response code from the HTTP request. If it was 200, meaning a success, then I'll return a new success. And whatever the raw content of the uh, of the thing was, I'll pop that in the success. Otherwise, I'll return a failure with, with a string that tells me what the response code was. So that means that by making the return type of download web content result of string, I'm saying that it inspected to have a string, but I don't know if it actually worked. I'm saying, telling you right now, I don't know if it worked, and it's up to you to decide if you care if it worked or not. But what if I want to convert my string outside that into something more reasonable? Like, you know, take this JSON string and turn it into an object. How do I do that? Well, it's 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 easily done. Here we go. A function called bind. Bind takes uh, a function which tells it how to transform string into whatever. Think of it as like a select, except it operates on the object as an entirety and not individual elements. So it's X here is string because 
the uh, raw string data that came out of my web content downloader was a result of string. So the X inside my bind is the string, the whole string. And then I'm giving it some sort of function, which is somewhere else in my code base, which is going to parse that string into a something fun class. Now the bind knows inside the bind whether it was a success or a fail and it will only execute the function passed in if there was success which means that even though we're operating on the raw string data the results of string the uh by uh, the this class here this function here get something fun doesn't need to know if the parsing was done or not basically it it's if it was a success it will be parsed and otherwise not Think of it like this. So we start with result, which either was success or failure. If it was failure, we're just going to put that failure back in a result box and move it on. If it was a success, then we're going to run the extra function and then put that success into a result box. And then whatever takes the new result box, which is now a result of something fun, uh, we'll take this box and decide, do you want to open this box and have a look to see what's inside it or just pass it along unmodified? That's your choice. You don't have to. And that's what it looks like. There are much more complicated versions of this logic. I've kept it simple for the purposes of this demonstration, but switch expression. Switch to see whether it's the previous thing was a success or not. If it was a success, run the function that was passed in as a func delegate, and then take the old value, put it into the function, and then make that the new value and return on. Otherwise, if it was a failure, just take the error and put it in back into an envelope box or whatever, the failure box, and pass it along. So it means you don't have to worry about dealing with what would otherwise have to be handled with either uh, an empty array if you requested an array of data, which tells you nothing. The empty array, does that mean that nothing was found? Or does that mean a failure? You don't know. Otherwise, you can have to do something like create a metadata object, which has got additional items on it with success, failed, true, and an error field, which you may or may not use. So you're adding to the complexity of the code base. Whereas if you use the results with success or failure, it's simple and elegant. It's a box that you can open or not, and you can pass it around as you want. And you can even change its type and just use the same style of enveloping. It's easy. This is kind of an example of what a monad is, but I'm not going to go further into monads because I don't want everyone's heads to hurt. Um, also, you could use it to do things like this. Let's say, imagine that you've got three stored procedures. You want to run one after the other. But if one of them fails, you don't want to continue. So you can use the same principle to say success or failure. And a success means run the next function. And then a failure means don't run the next function. There, that's, I'm only eight minutes over. Apologies again for the technical problems. Um, but this, again, is my book. Now, I've given you the super simple version of this. If you want to see the, the more complicated one that deals with more edge cases, goes deeper into things like functional theory to an extent, there you go. That is the book that I wrote. It took me a year or so to write. It is a bit silly, I do warn you. But um, that goes into a lot more about this. So if I've intrigued you with these ideas about how to write functional style code and you want to see how to do it in more depth, um, to cover more situations and to go further than I've given you in this little 40 minute demo, then do feel free to have a look at my book and other books too. Uh, Enrico Buonanno wrote one for Manning. He is also an incredibly good author and I recommend that book thoroughly as well. Thank you very much. And I will let everyone go and get on with their break. Apologies again for the technical problems, but I am around and I am here. I am also on Twitter and various other places. If anyone wants to reach out to me, my website address is in the corner of the screen up there. Feel free to get in touch if you have any questions whatsoever. And thank you very much indeed.